Despite the insistence of the smartest kid in your second grade class, you can't actually see the Great Wall of China from space. It's a wall. Great for protecting the Chinese Empire and its culture from the northern nomadic tribes, horrible for having a thing to look at from space. There's really only a handful of artificial structures that are clearly visible from space. Things like the Three Gorges Dam, the Pyramids of Giza, that province of Spain that they covered entirely in greenhouses, and this. This is a system of conveyor belts stretching 61 miles or 98 kilometers across whatever you want to call this country. The UN calls it Western Sahara, the locals call it the Sahari Arab Democratic Republic, and Morocco calls it Morocco. But whatever you call it, it's one of the emptiest places on Earth, with a population density that basically only beats out Greenland and some rocks that the UK hangs on to piss off Argentina. So what exactly is the world's longest conveyor belt system doing here of all places, and what does it even do? Well, the short answer is that it moves stuff. This stuff. Phosphate. Sweet, sweet phosphate. You need this stuff to make fertilizer, and you need fertilizer to make food, and you need food to make civilization, and you need civilization to make the television show Severance, and Severance is very good. Where does phosphate come from? It comes from here, the Bukra Phosphate Mine, smack dab in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It's over 60 miles, or almost 100 kilometers from the coast. The nearest place you could put the mineral on a ship and send it off to another country is here, the port in El Marsa. So how do you get the phosphate from here to here? That should be a simple question to answer, but it's not. At least, not in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Of course, there are some obvious restrictions here. One of the more popular ways of moving minerals over long distances, especially in remote areas like the Sahara, is something called a slurry pipeline. These are big, thick boys made out of really high-density plastic, and they carry a delicious smoothie of powdered ore, like iron or coal, mixed with water. These pipelines can run for dozens of miles, like this one that carries iron in Brazil, or this one for nickel in Madagascar. And the slurry can easily be dried out and turned back into a powdered mineral when it reaches its destination. The problem is that these pipelines need water, like millions of gallons of water, and the people living in the Sahara Desert would probably not be thrilled to learn that you used millions of gallons of their water to make a rock a little bit wet for about six hours. So that might not be the best solution for moving minerals across the Sahara, but there are some other obvious answers staring us in our face. For example, there's a road right there. The N5, one of the few paved roads in the region, runs basically straight from the coast to the mine. And if this was just some rinky-dink little mining operation, you might be able to move the phosphate with trucks. But rinky-dink it is not. This is one of the largest phosphate mines in the world, and it's sitting on top of close to 70% of all the phosphate on the planet. It produces a quantity of the mineral that a rapidly aging millennial would describe as a hecking chonker, which is approximately eight or 9,000 tons of phosphate a day. Moving that with trucks would take hundreds of trips, filled to capacity, circulating around the clock on a single road in, and I really feel like I need to make this clear, the actual middle of the actual Sahara Desert. Even if this wouldn't destroy the one road between the mine and the coast, which it probably would, you'd be pretty hard pressed to develop a brand new trucking industry in a country that's kind of not really a country and whose biggest city is about the size of Chandler, Arizona. At best, you could do a thing that is generally only done in the Australian outback, which is never a good sign, and create something called a road train. This is where you hitch a whole bunch of trailers to a single truck and run it, sort of like a train. In Australia, this is sometimes done to move ore across incredibly sparsely populated areas, and on roads that don't require you to make fancy moves like turning. Road trains, however, tend to be a whole lot less effective than train trains. Mine railways are a classic solution to the problems presented by trucks, and exist all around the world. Take the Mount Newman Railway in Australia, the QNSNL Railway in Canada, or the Mauritania Railway that lugs iron ore across the very same desert we've been discussing. All of these do the thing that we want, transporting minerals from a mine, or several mines, to a port on their country's coast. And they do this generally super well. A heavy haul ore train like the one in Australia can carry 24,000 tons of ore in a single trip. That's thanks to the fact that these trains are amongst the longest in the world. A standard ore train running the Mount Newman route is 268 cars long. That's about 1.7 miles, or nearly 3 kilometers, of pure, unadulterated train, and getting something like this to move at all requires two locomotives strung together at the front, and then two more in the middle that are controlled remotely. A train like this, though, could easily carry a day's worth of exports from Bukra in a single trip, and again, they run a very similar 210-car train just down here, so why isn't this a train? Well, this question frankly drove me crazy. I spent hours and hours scouring the internet, reading historical documents, and banging my head against a rock that had the words train facts painted on it, and I think I have two answers. One is boring, and one is kind of weird. 
Boring answer, this just happens to be an awkward distance for moving phosphate. It's obviously really far for a conveyor belt, but it's also pretty short for a train. Especially considering that it's just a mine and a port with literally nothing but sand in between. The Mauritania Railway down here is seven times longer, serves three different mines, and does actually stop at ten or so other places in between for passengers that want to brave what is often considered the most dangerous train in the world. So it's very possible that a railway just didn't make economic sense here, but the bigger problem, at least from what I've been able to find, is that trains just aren't cool enough. That is probably the real answer. This conveyor belt was built in 1973 when this area was called the Spanish Sahara. At the time it was under the control of Imperial Spain, but by the 1970s Spain was under a lot of pressure from the UN and Morocco and the locals to go away. But Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain at the time, had no interest in going away and a lot of interest in everyone else shutting up. So Franco decided that they needed to do something in the Sahara that would distract the Western media and convince people that colonialism is good, actually. A train probably wouldn't get people talking, but you know what would? The longest conveyor belt system in the world. The potential PR boost seemed like a no-brainer, with the New York Times calling it, quote, the most spectacular industrial undertaking before it was ever even built. So over the course of the next few years, they laid out 113,000 steel rollers from here to here, mounting them high above the desert shifting sands, covered them in 11 loops of cutting-edge steel reinforced belting, and then proceeded to surrender the entire region to Morocco about three years later. Without Daddy Spain's imperialism money, this conveyor belt has remained mostly unchanged since the 1970s. Alas, it keeps chugging away, still visible from space all those decades later, reminding us of its evergreen message that colonialism is awesome and that Francisco Franco was one cool dude. Now that I've made that statement, I'm sure our sponsor will be thrilled to learn that it's time to talk about them. If you live in America, your bread sucks. The stuff you buy at the grocery store is bland, flavorless, and still somehow filled with sugar. I, myself, was resigned to a life of depressing bread, but that all changed when I discovered Wild Grain. Wild Grain is a really exciting, first-of-its-kind service that does something that I genuinely love. Every month, they ship you a box full of artisanal, handmade breads, pastries, and pastas. All of it comes frozen and ready to bake, so you can have a beautiful loaf of fresh sourdough or a tray of cookies whenever you want. You can assemble a box of whatever speaks to you. Slow fermented olive oil ciabatta, pretzel buns, fettuccine, blueberry biscuits, and god, I'm getting so hungry just reading this stupid script. Look, this is a total no-brainer. Whether for you or as a gift, Wild Green is such an easy way to enhance your life. I never imagined I could be eating food this fresh and delicious at home every single day, at least without a huge hassle, but now, with Wild Green, my house is a bona fide bakery. Best of all, Wild Green donates four meals to the Greater Boston Food Bank for every single new sign up, so what are you waiting for? Start eating better by clicking on my link in the description and use my code HAI to get $30 off your first box, plus you'll get free croissants in every box.